in the year 1800. So 1800, that's the year Beethoven premiered Symphony No. 1 in Vienna. The year the first smallpox vaccination was given in North America. The year President John Adams became the first president to live in what is now called the White House. And the year Congress first met in Washington, D.C. You lived in 1800, and you lived and you had one dollar. One dollar, you would have the same purchasing power, be able to buy roughly the same amount of stuff, the same stuff, as if you had twenty-five dollars today. Twenty-five dollars would buy the same today. Of course, now, what you can buy today would not have been available in 1800, probably. And a common laborer in Philadelphia in 1800 only made one dollar every day. So if you make more than $25 a day, you can see your economy is actually doing better than perhaps it was in 1800. But the reason I give you all that is that it helps you understand what money is. It helps you really understand what money is. Money is a tool that allows us to convert the value of our work into a product of equivalent value, right? You do some work, you get some money, equal hopefully to the work you did, and then you use that money to buy something, hopefully equal to the value of the money you spent. So you, you give labor or sell products to get money, and money lets you buy other people's labor and products. So with that in mind, what happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden to money? What happened to money? I mean, they weren't carrying any cash. But something happened in the garden that really is shown in, in the way we deal with money, the way we think about money. When man was cursed, suddenly what was easy in the garden was going to be hard. The work of the garden was going to become hard work outside of the garden. Food would only come by the sweat of our brows. The ground itself was cursed. So this relationship between painful and frustrating work to get what we want is already showing that the fall messed up our finances, right? You have to work harder to get the same thing. But in reality, we also see that it affected our hearts, didn't it? Now fallen and sometimes lazy, we rebel against the idea of working for what we need. Now fallen and sometimes greedy. We don't want to pay a fair price for something. We want something for nothing. We're looking for a steal, right? Now fallen and sometimes selfish. We seek worldly pleasures at all costs. And fallen and sometimes selfish, we're reluctant to give of our wealth to help others. So basically, because of the fall's effect on the hearts of men and the ground itself, we are suddenly become people who want something for nothing, and often the something we want is a wicked something. And suddenly money gets stained, in a sense. So with that being true, with, with, with the idea of, of finances and money being damaged by the fall, it's no wonder that when Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, he deals with finances and what they should look like in his kingdom. Keeping with the Sermon on the Mount, keeping with the theme that that Jesus does change everything, I hope you won't be surprised that to learn that following Jesus means that you're going to have a different view of money than fallen people around you. You're going to think about your finances differently. Following Jesus changes your view of finances. Let's, let's read what Jesus says, and if you're able, I'd ask that you stand. Be reading from Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. And Christ says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Father, this is your word, and we pray that you would write this word on our hearts. Your spirit inspired it. We pray that your spirit would use it this morning to make us who you'd have us to be as followers of Jesus Christ. Help us to hear your word, to believe it, to obey it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So if you're going to follow Jesus, Jesus is going to change your view of finances. This whole section, verse 19, it's all about treasure. And verse 24, it's all about money. So everything here is about finances. Following Jesus will change your view of finances. If you're going to follow Jesus as a citizen in his kingdom and pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you're going to have to do it three ways. Jesus tells us three ways that you need to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances. So first of all, to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you need to consider your end game. You need to consider your end game. Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And he explains why. Then he says, but lay up yourself treasures in heaven. And he explains why. So that's pretty easy to follow his argument, right? Don't do this, here's why. Do this, here's why. So let's consider each piece of that. First of all, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. This idea of laying up treasure, it, it's about building an account for the future. It is, it is setting aside or investing in wealth that you will be able to use for your heart's desire in the future. You lay up your treasure in support of your heart's desire. Your end game, right? I'm, I'm laying up my treasure for what I want to do when I need that treasure. So what is that? What is that end game? If your life's end game is retirement to a houseboat in Miami, Deb, Debbie laughs because she remembers when the investment advisor had me pretty convinced. Um, you may be saving money in a bank or an IRA or something in Pennsylvania, but you're laying up treasure in a boat in Miami. Right? That's your end game. If your life's end game is a big inheritance for your kids and grandkids to spend after you die. You may be saving money in a bank in Pennsylvania, but you're laying up treasure wherever your kids and your grandkids end up. Right? That's where you're laying up treasure. That's how treasure works. It's all about the end game. Where is that treasure going to be used for? And Jesus declares that all earthly end games fall short of his plan for his followers. That all the earthly end games are a bad end game. He also explains why. Because on earth, moth and rust destroy, and thieves break in and steal. The finest clothing worn by my great great grandparents has been thrown out because it was worn out or became food for moths. I don't have like great great grandpa's suit hanging in my closet. But my first car. Treasured investment by 16-year-old Don. I'm sure it is completely destroyed by now. Last time I saw it, it was a rust bucket held together with metal screws. And thieves. Thieves don't just break through the mud. That's what the break-in and steal was. The mud walls of homes like they did in Jesus' day anymore. They hack your accounts and they take your treasure. Thieves have a way to get stuff. If you invest for the end and your end game is on earth, you do it poorly. If you invest for something that's not going to be there. Right? That's Jesus' point. If you're a Christian, your end game is not on the earth in this fallen state that it's in. So if you invest for that, it's not going to be there. Jesus demands something better. He says instead, do lay up your treasures for yourselves in heaven. Lay up treasure in heaven. You're to think of the wealth you gain here on earth as something useful for building an account in heaven. Now it makes sense that Jesus would say this in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? The Sermon on the Mount is the word of King Jesus to the citizens of his kingdom about life in his kingdom. 
And as he's going to tell Pontius Pilate, the ultimate best expression of the kingdom of Jesus is not of this world. Right? This fits so well with what Paul says. In Ephesians 2, Paul explains the wealth of heaven. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So Jesus, sent by God as an act of love, has saved you by his grace. Why? You've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Our God, who is rich in mercy, has a treasure of mercy, seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are with Christ in the heavenlies now, seated spiritually with Christ in the heavenlies, to show the riches, the treasure, the wealth, of his grace toward us in Christ. Laying up treasure in heaven is going along with the gospel work that Christ has done in you to save you. He has laid up riches for us in heaven. He, you are riches he laid up in heaven. And he says, you lay up your riches there too. So you invest, you lay up treasures where King Jesus rules when you live in light of his kingdom. And the reason he gives is the flip side of the reason you don't lay up treasures here on earth. In the heavenly kingdom, neither moth nor rust destroys, and thieves do not break in and steal. This is a good investment. It's an investment where your investment is safe. This is better than the FDIC. This is the Almighty God. This is heaven. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Instead, lay up for your selves treasures in heaven because treasures in heaven will last forever but you also do it because the treasures in heaven will testify where your treasure is there your heart will be also you lay up treasures in heaven because that is a testimony as to the state of your heart where you lay up your treasure testifies to your love, testifies to your loyalty. If your love is for things treasured by the kingdoms of this world, your loyalty is to those kingdoms and you will lay up your treasure in the kingdoms of this world. If your love is for things treasured by the king of heaven and your loyalty is to the king of heaven, you will lay up your treasures there. Your investment strategy, laying up treasures in support of your end game, reveals the condition of your heart. It is part of your testimony, what you do with your treasures. Your spending is a testimony as to where your loyalty lies. To pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you need to consider your end game. So let me encourage you to take a second and think about that. Think about what, how you're doing with this treasure building end game of yours. What, what have you invested your treasure in the most? Where have you directed your treasure? Where have you spent your money? Has it gone to things that will last? Or has it gone to things that won't last? Things with eternal significance? are things with significance that will fade constantly with time. As I thought about this, I thought about how you as a church gave support to Abigail to go on a mission trip. And it's awesome. That's awesome. Because you gave to show your love for a sister in Christ. That is a testimony how the gospel brought us together as the family of God and how you love the family of God. That's heavenly treasure. Also, you gave to Cinder to show the love of Christ to people in the Dominican Republic that you've never met. You've never met to help draw others to Christ through the gospel. That is an eternal investment. That is laying up treasure in heaven. You also gave to Cinder on a mission trip being led by a sister church 
people we are united to in only one way, that is through the gospel, that is an eternal investment. And that is awesome. That is laying up treasures in heaven. But I, I think we'd all have to admit that we don't always have the right end game when it comes to our treasure. You live in the United States of America where, where the marketing machine is bigger than anywhere else in the world that wants you to lay up your treasures everywhere else but the kingdom of heaven. Right? And sometimes it works. Doesn't it? So what can we do? Well, I, I think if we see ourselves being too earthly minded regarding our treasure, and I think if you ask God to show you if you are, I think he will be faithful to do that. If we find that we are, praise God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We can repent. And then we need to ask ourselves, where do I need to put my treasure where it is a kingdom investment? Where it is a kingdom investment. And, you know, maybe that, that has to do with your time, of course, too. But it's certainly, and Jesus uses the word treasure on purpose, has to do with your money. So think about what can I invest in that will have heavenly significance. And that doesn't, don't, don't hear the preacher saying that means you just got to put more in the offering plate. There are many ways you invest that have eternal significance. Ask the Lord to show those to you, too. So to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you need to consider your end game. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Because to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you also need to consider your values. Your values. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Now these two verses are not quite as simple to understand, are they? We want to go all biological here and figure out how the eye, the body, and light and darkness are working together, right? I really think there is just, if we would just be a little simpler and not demand the Bible be teaching us biology in the Sermon on the Mount, I think we'll find this to be a pretty easy one. Jesus is not teaching biology. He's using simple truth and building a spiritual metaphor for the truth. Here's the metaphor. A healthy eye is focused on loving God, loving neighbors, others more than self, and God overall. That's a healthy eye. It's focused on those kind of things. An unhealthy eye is focused on unhealthy things, the things of the earth, the flesh, and selfish, and carnal appetites. The Lord dwells where? He dwells in unapproachable light. So if your eye is focused on the things of God, you are focused on the light. And your eye takes in the light. Right? The world outside of Christ is the world of darkness. The Bible talks that way all the time. Like the creation before God ever shined light into it. And, and the way the pagan lands are called places of darkness. And an eye focused on the world outside of Christ is focused on the darkness and it doesn't take in any light and stays dark. Right? The soul is left in the dark. Jesus is going much deeper, but the point's not far off. The intent of the line in that little children's song, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. What do you focus your eyes on? You focus on the things that you value in your heart. A car lover sees a Corvette parked next to an old Ford Pinto and he doesn't focus on the Pinto. Because he's a weird car lover. Right? You focus on the things you value in your heart. When your values are healthy, you focus on the things that God values. That God says are valuable, you focus on them and you value them. Things like justice, righteousness, care for the needy, love for the brother, evangelizing the lost. And the Lord fills your life with light as you focus on those things. Right? But when your values are unhealthy, 
When your values are unhealthy, you focus on the things the world values. Things like greed, sexual sin, power, and pride. You focus on those things and you're left dwelling in darkness. Now in case you're wondering, Jesus has not strayed from his topic dealing with treasure. Where do you focus your eyes? You focus them on what you value, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. Where do you spend your money? You spend your money on things you value. Right? It's the thing that is valuable to you. You give your treasure for because your eye is focused on it. So to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you need to consider your values. You know, whenever we think about the Bible and money, one of the stories that comes up the most often is the story, the wonderful story about the widow and her might, right? Her money. In Mark 12, we learn about time. Jesus sat down opposite of the temple treasury and he watched people come and go, putting their offerings into the temple treasury. It was a very public thing that you did. There were a lot of rich people giving that day and they were giving some really big offerings. But this, this poor widow came and she put in two small copper coins, which was not much. It was nothing really. But Jesus called his disciples over and said to them, I tell you what, this poor widow gave more than everybody else because she, well, they gave out of their surplus. She gave all she had to live on for the work of the Lord. Now this, this, this widow, she had so little that the temple didn't, couldn't, couldn't start a new building project with what she gave. It wasn't like her offering was so important they could start a new ministry with it, right? And, and everybody would have said, poor widow, you've got nothing. Why don't you keep it and buy a scrap of food so you can at least enjoy your last moments? Everybody would have said, that's fine. But Jesus praises her because she gives her last coins for the work of the Lord. Because that's what she valued. She valued the work of the Lord beyond even her own life. She praised the state of her heart. Now, a hard question to ask, but I think we all have to ask it. I find it very hard to ask myself. What would Jesus say after he watched you do what you do with your money over the last month? What would Jesus say? What would, what would he think you value based on what you do with your money? If answering that question leaves you a bit concerned, it probably should. I mean, at this point, any preacher will tell you, don't feel that bad about it, we're all that way. Well, if it's wrong, it's not good that we're all that way. Right? We live in a land and an age where we are swimming in wealth compared to the generations of the past and all the peoples in the world around us. And we spend it. We have to ask ourselves whether or not what we are spending on, what we value enough to spend it on, is bringing more and more light into our soul or more darkness. Are you closer in your walk with the Lord because of the way you spend your money? The spending your money, the way you spend it, bring the light of Christ into your life? Or does it tie you a little closer to the darkness? Well, it, it reveals what you value. And what you value will show in your heart. So to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you need to consider the end game. You need to consider your values. And you need to consider your master. You need to consider your master. Jesus says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or God and money. Everything we've been talking about boils down to this, doesn't it? If you're serving the right master with all your being, you're going to be working toward the master's end game. Your end game is his end game. Right? If you're serving the right master with all your being, you're going to share his values. You're going to value what he values. The options available to you aren't many here either, right? 
Jesus doesn't say, I, I got about 12 masters you can choose from. He says it's either God or it's money. God or wealth, really, would be a good translation of that. God or wealth. Now, two words make this verse stronger as a statement by the Lord than you might even imagine by reading it. The first word is the word for serve. It is the word duleo. Duleo. That is the verb form of the noun slave. Noun slave. Friends, you may be able to hold down two jobs for two different bosses and serve them well. Many of you have or currently do this. Many of my bivocational pastor friends do this. But a slave is the property of one owner, not two. To be a slave is by definition to be owned by and owe total loyalty to one master and only one master. So the first word, this word serve, is to be slave of either God or money. The second word, the word for master in verse 24, is the word kurios. Kurios. This word shows up 713 times in the New Testament. And it's translated as Lord 651 times. The question Jesus is demanding that you settle is this. Who is your financial Lord and Master? Who is the Lord and Master over you such that it shows in the way you handle your finances? Who is your Lord? When it comes to money and wealth, either God is the Lord over you or money is the Lord over you. You are devoted to and you serve only one. And look at what he says. The one who is your Lord and Master gets your love and devotion. The one who is not, you hate and despise. So Jesus is saying, you're a pretty good slave. You're going to be loving and devoted to the one you serve and you're going to hate and despise the one you don't. You are devoted to one Master. But think about that. That means there is no middle ground. If money and the accumulation of wealth, either for the love of wealth or the love of what it buys, is if, if that is what the evidence indicates that you love and devoted to, if you love and you are devoted to wealth and the stuff you can get with wealth, Jesus says you're not living as though that is your Lord and Master. Right? You're living as though that is your Lord and Master. Money, wealth is your Lord and Master. But if you live a life of faith, a life of faith, working as hard to provide for your needs while trusting that God will take care of you and using what wealth you can accumulate to gain for His glory, Jesus says that kind of life is a testimony that you can truly say and mean it, Jesus is Lord. The way you handle your money declares who your Lord and Master is. It is either or, and the implications are significant. So to pursue kingdom righteousness in your finances, you need to consider your Master. Now you may have heard this story already. It was a story first told, I think, by the, the great British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I wish I could tell it in his voice because, well, he's British, it's deep, and it's cool. But I can't, so I'll just tell you the story. It's the story of a farmer. One day this farmer came into the house all excited and he told his wife how his prized cow had given birth to twin calves, a red one and a white one. He was so thankful. And he told his wife, you know, I feel led by the Lord to dedicate one of the calves to him. We will raise them together. Then when the time comes to sell them, we will keep the proceeds from one calf and we will give the proceeds from the sale of the other calf to the Lord's work. His wife asked him which calf he would dedicate to the Lord. He answered her, there's no reason to settle that now. We will treat them both the same. And when the time comes, we'll sell them just as I've said. Well, a few months later, the man came into the house from the barn and he was looking rather sad and miserable. When his wife asked what was troubling him, he said, I have bad news. The Lord's calf has died. But his wife responded, you didn't decide which calf was the Lord's yet. He says, oh yes, he replied. 
I, I had always determined it was to be the white one and it's the white calf that died. Friends, unless you determine from the very start what money and possessions are yours as a mere, that money and possessions that you have are yours as a mere stewardship where you are managing the wealth of your master, the Lord Jesus Christ, unless you determine that from the beginning, I can guarantee you it will always be the Lord's calf that dies. Unless he is already your master, money will be. Don't wait for the day to figure that out. Either God is master over your money and your wealth from the start, or the truth will eventually come to light that money is your master. So which is it? Which is it? I, I, as a pastor, I am very glad that I just preached through books of the Bible because choosing to preach on money doesn't make doesn't make your ministry one that's going to be very popular. But the reality is, Jesus did. Jesus did. And, and as said early on this message, what he said is that if you're going to be a citizen of his kingdom, and you're going to practice that kingdom righteousness that is greater than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're going to need to have kingdom righteousness in your finances going to be all about your financial end game, your financial values, and your financial master. Jesus gave us three ways to think about it, and they all speak to the state of our hearts. So the real question we each need to deal with is what is the state of our hearts this morning? What is the state of your heart? Now, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I never see a statement that says who gives what in the church. I I, I honestly know that I've been blessed by the generosity of the church frequently. So, so I have a good, good opinion of it. But I don't know. I don't know what your ultimate end game is, what your values are, and what master you're really serving. But if you're dealing with the Spirit of God right now, you probably do. Let me encourage you. Listen to the Spirit. And if he is calling you to repent, there is nothing more wonderful, light-giving, life-giving that you could do this morning than repent. It will be a joy to repent. We hear that word repent, it sounds gloomy, doesn't it? Because it means you've sinned. But repent isn't gloomy. Re sin is gloomy. Repentance is the Almighty God forgiving you of your sin because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is joy and light and good, right? So if, if you are being led to repent, repent. It is a great place to be. Now, if you are already someone who has dealt with this and you've dealt with it well, give thanks to God for giving you a heart like that. Because the human heart is not naturally that way. So if your heart is already that way, if you have that generous heart that I will use what I've got for the glory of God heart, let me encourage you. God has blessed you and you can thank God that the testimony of your life is that He is your Lord. But do that. Consider. Consider this morning your financial end game. Consider your financial values. Consider your financial master. Now, Given what Jesus has said in this verse, these verses, I, I cannot imagine that a lot of us feel real comfortable. I, I can't. I mean, I, I look around my, my house and go out there in the garage and I see the pile of stuff that testifies to what I have valued over time. Right? So, let's just make a commitment. Let, let, let's commit dealing with the past by dealing with the Lord. But let's make a commitment this morning going forward. That, that we will share His end game. That we will value what He values. And that in our finances, Jesus Christ will be Lord. 
I think if you make that commitment this morning, I think I could say this with some real confidence, the Lord will give you an opportunity to test that this week. You will have an opportunity to test whether that is true, if you'll make that commitment. So I would encourage you to do that. Let Him provide you with that opportunity. Follow the Lord in it and have that light shine into your life. Know the joy of your Lord with regard to your finances. Now, if the thought of doing that, if the thought of committing your finances to the Lord is terrifying to you and you just don't want to do it, right now you're hearing that, you hear the words of Jesus and you say, I don't like that. I'm willing for Jesus to save me from hell. I'm willing for him to give me heaven. I'm willing to come to church on Sundays, but Lord, leave my checkbook alone. Then I would encourage you to consider whether you've ever accepted that Jesus is your Lord. If your heart is in utter rebellion against him because he would touch your finances, I would ask you, have you ever really trusted him as your Lord and Savior this morning? Have you ever really trusted him for, for the salvation that he brings to every sinner by the death on the cross? Have you ever said, yes, that's mine. I believe I am a sinner, even in my finances, and that Jesus has saved me from that. Because if you have, then you recognize He's not just a Savior, He's a Lord. And the idea that you would commit your finances to Him as Lord would be a joy. So if your heart rebels against the Lord being the Lord of your finances, I would ask you, believe the gospel today. Believe the gospel. Believe that you are a sinner. That you've even sinned with your money. Believe that Jesus Christ came and as an act of great grace and mercy motivated by the love of the Father, that Jesus the Son came and died on the cross for that and all your other sins, paid the price in full, rose again on the third day to be your Lord, and then commit your life to following Him. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word even when your word challenges us. For God, we desire, we who have been saved, we desire to live a life that testifies that you are Lord. God, just show us how. Show us what we need to do this morning. Open our eyes to places where we need to repent. Give us the courage to do so. God, give us the conviction to follow you in this. Help us to see when the opportunities arise, what, what is before us so that we might make the decision to treasure what you treasure, to pursue what you pursue, and to serve you as our master. And Lord, if there's one this morning who, who, who recognizes in this verse their sin and desires, Lord, sees their desires as fallen and, and recognizes they need to be rescued from this, I pray that today they would trust in Jesus and be saved. And ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Tom is going to come lead us in our closing.